Hello and welcome to the second video of the module 2 of the CCNA switching and routing essentials. Today we're going to talk about switches. Specifically we're going to talk about concepts and configuration of set switches. So we already know that a switch is a device that allows different end devices to connect properly and efficiently to a network. Uh, today we're going to talk about a very unique kind of switch which of course is a Cisco switch. So a Cisco switch has very particular characteristics for once it's self-configurable which means there are a lot of processes that run along with the switch when you connect them. We are going to talk about them now. When you connect a switch, a Cisco switch, different kinds of processes start. For uh, First there is a power on self-test or post. Uh, then there is a bootloader. There is bootloader, which allows a low-level CPU initialization. And uh, it also initializes a flash file system. And finally, it locates and loads the operating system. So a uh, bootloader is a very important part of the switch. A uh, bootloader is a program that loads the operating system after making some self-tests. So to access a bootloader you need to connect the PC, your PC to a switch via console cable. Then you need to power down then power up the switch by unplugging and plugging it again. And you need to press and hold the mode button. You need to see a flashing green light in the system LED. Then it turns to amber and then to solid green. Uh, LEDs are really important switches. Actually, there are six LEDs in a switch. The first, of, of course, is a system LED, which is for power. Then there is a redundant power system. If it's off, that means it's not properly connected. There is a port status LED which uh, it's for the state of the port. The port duplex LED, which is uh, it indicates the du duplex is selected. The port speed LED and the power over Ethernet. So now we are going to talk about the SVI or the switch virtual interface. This is really important because it allows us to configure the switch because we cannot manually do so. Um, of course, we already know most of the concepts of how to configure a switch. We've already seen it. We know that to configure it, we need to, uh, through the SVI, input a um, IP address. And of course, we also need to configure a default gateway. So these are the basic commands for it. Okay, so um, there's also the concept of the full duplex and the half duplex, which we already know. The only maybe new information is that the half duplex communication varies from 50 to 60 percent bandwidth, whereas the full duplex has uh, has a 100 percent bandwidth times two, so 200 percent efficiency. Of course, it is also possible to configure the full duplex through the SVI and the speed of it. It is also possible to run an auto MDIX which makes it possible to connect a switch with any, either cable uh, straight through or crossover depending on how new the switch is. Now we're going to talk about the show interfaces command, which is a very important command because it allows you to see the state of the switch at the moment and it gives a lot of information about how the switch is operating. So there are many parameters you need to be watching for in this um, command. Uh, they are basically runt frames, giants, giants, CRC errors, collisions, and light collisions. So runt frames are Ethernet frames shorter than 64 byte 
and they're done by, by malfunctioning network interface cards. Giants are the opposite, they're bigger Ethernet frames. CRC errors indicate a media or cable error, and many of these are caused by too much noise in the link. Collisions are normal in a half duplex communication, and late collisions are collisions that happened after a 512 bits, and they're done by excessive cable length or a duplex misconfiguration. So these are the ones you need to be watching for. Now we're going to talk about the security part. This is a very important part of the second module. First, we're going to talk about SSH or Secure Shell which is a protocol that provides an encrypted connection to a remote device and it is better than Telnet in that it is encrypted and of course more secure. So there are different kinds of um, commands you need to learn for SSH. The first one is the show IP SSH which verifies the SSH support. Uh, the second one is the IP domain name to configure the IP domain. Then uh, the crypto key generate RSA to generate the RSA key pairs or the crypto key serialize RSA to remove the key pairs. The user in secret uh, command to configure user authentication you need a username and a password for that and the trans transport input SSH to configure VTY lines. Now we're going to talk about a common attacks done on switches. The first one is MAC flooding. So imagine you have a network like this and A wants to send a message to B so of course the message will reach the switch and the switch is going to check in a MAC address table for the port where the MAC of B is. Of course, it's not here. So what the switch is going to do, it's going to flood all the network with this message except for the port 1 where A is. Uh, eventually B is going to get the message and C is going to drop the message. But what's going to happen here is that B the switch is going to learn where B is and it's going to fill it in the table. So next time A wants to send a message to B, it's not going to go through C. It's only going to get to A. So what an attacker does, an attacker is going to send messages with bogus MAC addresses in an attempt to fill the MAC address table so no new addresses can be learned by the switch. Okay, so next time A wants to send a message to B, uh, the switch will not will not have B in the MAC address table. So it's going to obviously it's going to flood again the whole network in an attempt to reach B, but this time. Uh, the switch is not going to learn about B because the table is already full, so it's going to be flooding the network every time. Okay, now we're going to talk about the DHCP starvation attack. It is a type of attack where the hacker floods the DHCP server with DHCP requests. Eventually what this does is it runs out of available IP addresses, so the network becomes unreachable. This is a very common type of attack. Then there is also the uh, DHCP spoofing in which the attacker configures a fake DHCP server to issue DHCP addresses to clients. So the clients are forced to use the attacker as a default gateway. Also very common. Okay, now we're going to talk about attacks done on Telnet. There are two main ones, the brute force attack uh, in which the uh, hacker uses uh, software to make common password guesses and guesses with all words in a dictionary and eventually uses sequential characters in an attempt to guess a uh, password. 
and with enough time, eventually all passwords can be guessed through brute force attack. There is also the um, the denial of service attack, which is similar to the starvation attack, uh, through bogus attempts to reach a network eventually valid attempts to reach a network are become completely unavailable so these are two common telnet attacks so what to do against this okay there are several steps you can take first one is to develop a written security policy to prevent this um, kinds of attacks also to use strong passwords and change them often control physical access to devices implement security hardware and software like firewalls keep up to date with patches and updates and of course to educate employees about social engineering attacks another way to make a network more secure is to shut down unused ports or secure them. Uh, of course this can be done through the basic uh, shutdown command. But it can also be achieved through this, uh, this other command, the, the interface range type in which you can actually uh, delimit a range of ports that are not being used. Okay, the DHCP snooping. This is very important because it determines which switch port can respond to DHCP requests. There are several commands you need to learn to use DHCP snooping. The first one is IP DHCP snooping, which allows uh, snooping in the switch. Uh, then there is a DHCP snooping VLAN, which allows the snooping for the VLAN. The DHCP snooping trust, which determines which ports you can trust, and the snooping limit rate, which is optional and uh, talks about how many bogus attempts can you handle. Okay, now we talk about port security, uh, which limits the number of valid MAC addresses allowed in a port. Um, by doing this, you turn a MAC address into a secure MAC address, and there are three types of secure MAC address. The static secure MAC address, which is um, configured manually. The dynamic secure MAC address, which is configured dynamically. And the sticky secure MAC address, which can be configured either manually or dynamically. Okay, violation mode. Um, that's what happens either when the maximum number of secure MAC addresses has been added to the table or when a learned address is seen on another interface within the same VLAN. There are three kinds of violation modes, protect, restrict, and shutdown. The third one is really important because it enters, it makes the switch enter an error disabled state and that's a state that can only be um, removed either with no shutdown or the shutdown command. Now we're going to talk about the show port security command. It's uh, an important command because it allows you to see the uh, state of the port security at the moment. There are some a lot of concepts we already learned, like the sticky MAC addresses and the maximum MAC addresses. Finally, we're going to talk about MTP, which is the network time protocol. This is very important if you want two or more devices to be synchronized, uh, thus becoming more efficient and, of course, more secure. Uh, in the MTP, you may want a device to be synchronized with another device in which case you would use the NTP server IP address or you may want a device to become uh, the master and every device is then synchronized to this device. You then use the NTP master and you need to have a stratum. There are 15 different strata 
and you need to choose one. If you don't, the default stratum is going to be number eight. Okay, so this concludes the chapter. Thank you very much. Um, this was just an overview of the module two. Please visit the module two to see what was missing. But we hope this was um, of some help to you and we will see you again. Thank you.